Welcome everyone to the IUCN WCPA Fred M. Packard Award online ceremony. The, this event is part of IUCN and WCPA's Vital Sites series of online events. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, a few more attendees to join in, and then I will pass this over to our Master of Ceremonies for today's event, Trevor Sandworth, Director of IUCN's Global Protected and Conserved Areas Program. Well, good day to everybody, wherever you are in the world. As uh, Ruchia just mentioned, I'm Trevor Sandworth and I'm Director of IUCN's Global Protected and Conserved Area Program, also focal point for the World Commission on Protected Areas in the IUCN Secretariat. We'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, really important event that we are hosting today. The Fred M. Packard Awards for Outstanding Service to Protected and Conserved Areas. So perhaps just as we start and as people are joining, um, it's quite clear that our event today is being conducted under very, very different circumstances than past award ceremonies and what we would have liked but in discussion with the chair of WCPA, we felt we couldn't wait to confer these awards on our exceptional awardees today. Uh, something to give us a little hope as we uh, navigate our way through uh, the, the global pandemic. As Ruchia mentioned, this event forms part of a series of events which we call vital sites. Vital sites, obviously a play on the, the idea of vital signs protected and conserved areas in the world, such important places for the future of humanity, for human health and well-being. And as we start this award ceremony, we, we think of all of the managers and custodians of these sites around the world who are normally exceptional. They do their work under incredibly difficult circumstances in many cases and come up with innovative approaches. And today we're going to award the Fred M. Packard Award to uh, another group of exceptional people, as you will shortly uh, come to, to learn. Please note, just for the record, that we will be recording this session so that we can provide the edited video to uh, others who were not able to join because of the time uh, constraints in different parts of the world. So just so that you know that that is happening. And what I'd like to do is to suggest that you use the chat box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, says chat. Perhaps even just to introduce yourself, use whatever language you like to, tell us where you, who you are and where you're from and what your connection is. And of course, when you hear the awards being announced, please leave your own congratulations, your own comments in the chat box because all of those comments will be packaged as part of that recording and made available to the winners. Many of them are hoping that uh, they can uh, send on this recording to their own uh, constituency and their, their, their own supporters. So just to give you a little bit of idea of how we will run the event today, I'll start by inviting the chair of the World Commission on Protected Areas, Dr. Kathy McKinnon, to say a few words of welcome, including about uh, the, uh, the award itself. And then uh, we have a, a video message from the Director General of IUCN, Dr. Bruno Oberle. And following that, we will move straight into the award ceremony. We've planned this today so that we have invited several leading uh, figures, if you like, in, in our world of protected and conserved areas to actually read the citations and uh, to be a part of the ceremony. And you will, you will obviously be introduced to them as we go on. So I think because of the time constraints and the way we have to work, that I'm going to move straight into uh, inviting Dr. Kathy McKinnon, Chair of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, to say a few words of welcome. Kathy. Thanks, Trevor. Welcome, everyone. As chair of WCPA, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this meeting. WCPA was one of the first IUCN commissions to be established. 
we celebrated our 60th anniversary last year. And we had hoped to have this award ceremony as part of those celebrations. It still may be possible to hold an in-person event in Marseille at the Protected Planet Pavilion. But we wanted to take this opportunity to celebrate now online as well. The Fred M. Packard Award is named after Fred Packard, who was secretary to WCPA in the 1970s. The award is given to exceptional people for outstanding contributions to protected and conserved areas. Since 1982, when the first award was given, more than 120 recipients have received this award, mostly at major events like the World Conservation Congress, but also at some regional meetings, and most recently at the third Latin American and Caribbean Parks Congress in Lima, Peru. The award can be given both to individuals and organizations, and the list of awardees available on the WCPA website reflects their achievements. It includes former heads of protected area agencies, NGO staff, indigenous people, and sometimes rangers, including the rangers of the Rurongo National Park and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Awardees have come from all corners of the globe, from Canada to Australia to Argentina, from South America to Africa and Asia, reflecting the nominees' contributions to conservation on land and sea. One of the few silver linings in these especially difficult times has been an increased appreciation of the values that nature brings to human health, well-being and welfare. Protected and conserved areas give us hope on the pathway to recovery, providing natural solutions, not just to prevent future pandemics, but to other global challenges, such as halting biodiversity loss and addressing the climate change crisis. Today, we are honoring nine truly remarkable people nominated by their peers for their outstanding service as champions in supporting and promoting protected areas and major conservation efforts across the world. This is, in effect, the Oscars of the protected areas world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kathy, um, for those words of welcome. And now I'm going to ask Ruchia to please uh, screen the video that is of Dr. Bruno Obele, the Director General of IUCN, who couldn't be here in person. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are in the world today. I'm very pleased to speak at today's ceremony of the IUCN WCPA Fred Packard Award for two reasons. Firstly, I'm happy to highlight the importance of protected and conserved areas and to celebrate the nine exceptional individuals who have done so much for these areas. Secondly, I know there are many members here today from WCPA, the World Commission on Protected Areas. And I, as the AUCN Directors General, want to use this opportunity to show my appreciation for the more than 3,000 WCPA members and the work they do for our planet. This award ceremony is an IUCN Commission event and the network of volunteers in our commissions add so much value to our organization. This expertise will be crucial to help the world successfully implement a post-2020, post-COVID recovery that resets the relationship between people and planet. Protected and conserved areas, which lie at the very heart of nature conservation, will play a key role in these as cost-effective nature-based solutions that help to halt biodiversity loss, mitigate climate change and protect human health welfare and livelihood. As IUCN Global Protected Areas Programme promotes 
protected areas in post-COVID recovery strategies worldwide. Our staff will work hand in hand with WCPA. This is the only way to achieve success. As I have said many times before, I may represent IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, but the U is the most important letter in our name. The Union is what makes us great. To the nine individuals that we are celebrating at this ceremony, we are grateful to you because you have helped to make us the organization we are today. We hope you will continue to inspire, inspire all those in conservation and beyond. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Dr. Uh, Oberle. And, uh, and now we will move to the actual conferring of the awards. So I have the pleasure again to invite Cathy to lead the way to present the first award, Cathy. And be, perhaps, be, Cathy, before you, you start, please be aware that there, there is a, a, a recorded format of slides and, and images for each of these. We've deliberately created space for you to have time to let the ideas sink in. So if there's a little bit of a delay in the presentation, that's why. Cathy? Thanks very much, Trevor. It gives me great pleasure to give the first award to James Jim Barnes. And this is in recognition of James Barnes for his lifelong dedication to the protection and preservation of Antarctica, the world's last great wilderness. As founder of the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean Coalition, ASOC, Jim was instrumental in a global campaign to prevent mining on the Antarctic continent. As a result of this campaign, plans to sign a mining treaty for the Antarctic were abandoned in 1989. Instead, they were replaced with a comprehensive environmental protection treaty that includes a mining ban. Throughout his career, Jim has held Antarctic governance bodies to account. Jim and ASOC, the only environmental NGO observer in the Antarctic treaty system, were key drivers of an initiative to designate a network of marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. Jim worked with scientists and campaigners to build a strong case for designating a marine protected area in the Ross Sea. This led to a designation of the world's largest high seas marine protected area in 2016. Today, Jim serves ASOC as board chair reflecting his commitment to protecting the Antarctic, including expanding the network of large marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. Please join me in celebrating Jim Barnes receiving this Packard Award. Thank you. That's wonderful. And thank you so much, Jim, for the work that you are doing. As I said, please enter your comments in the chat box. I see there are comments going in uh, so that they can be re recorded as part of the presentation. Let us invite Jim to respond to his award. Uh, it's an honor to receive this award from IUCN, which I'm accepting on behalf of colleagues in the uh, ASOC. Uh, all the outcomes of the last 40 years are frankly the result of many individuals and organizations working together and certainly not me alone in any sense at all. Uh, my conservation trajectory began in 1977 when I was a public interest lawyer in Washington advocating for what we called unrepresented interests. And Antarctica met that definition perfect, perfectly. 
Uh, that year, I was invited to join a public advisory committee on Antarctica, which brought together uh, experts and scientists from all the US agencies. And that opened my eyes about secret plans to exploit oil and gas resources, as well as the out of control fishing going on in the Southern Ocean. Frankly, there was little public knowledge of what went on behind the scenes, behind the closed doors of Antarctic Treaty meetings. There was no public input, there were no public reports released after meetings, and often these discussions focused more on economics than on the environment. Uh, only 12 nations, the original members of the Antarctic Treaty were included, and all NGOs and international organizations were excluded. Sharing what I learned with NGOs around the world, we created ASOC in 1978 to advocate full protection of the region as a world park. And we borrowed those words from the 1972 World Parks Congress resolution. To ASOC, that meant dedicating Antarctica to peace, science, and environmental protection with uh, all minerals activities banned and fishing only allowed based on taking ecosystem impacts into account. Those were radical ideas at the time. That year, the US invited an NGO to serve as an advisor on its Antarctic delegation for the first time. And in 1980, Australia and the UK did too. Being able to know what was on the table and who was responsible for decisions allowed NGOs to report to their members, journalists, the UN and the public at large. Providing accurate facts and analysis is a key facet of all ASOC advocacy and media outreach. In that time frame, since NGOs were not allowed inside, ASOC demonstrated outside Antarctic venues and published ECO, an independent newspaper for delegates and journalists. We began a partnership with IUCN in 1978 and became a member in 1980, and Antarctic resolutions have been agreed at each General Assembly since then. Um, IUCN and ASOC experts played a big role in negotiating the first ecosystem as a whole fishing treaty uh, called the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Liver Living Resources, or CAMELAR, which was signed in May 1989. I believe that laid a good foundation for scientifically based fishing regulation and for MPAs and remains a model for the world. Uh, briefly about the Minerals Convention, well, blocking that took a global effort and went, went on for almost 10 years. ASOC and its member groups led by Greenpeace carried out demonstrations and petition drives all over the world. And I have to mention my mentor, Sir Peter Scott, who assisted with high level advocacy. He was a great hero to me and to many others. Uh, we raised the question of Antarctica at the UN General Assembly for the first time, opening the Antarctic Treaty System to international scrutiny. At the end of the nine, 10 year period, we worked closely with Jacques Cousteau who convinced France to reject the convention in 1989, while Australian NGOs did the same. Because of the consensus rulemaking procedures in the uh, Antarctic Treaty System, the convention was dead. Uh, next, negotiation of the protocol that was mentioned earlier uh, began in 1990, and it moved very quickly. And by October 1991, the so-called Madrid Protocol was signed. It does include a minerals ban. It can be reviewed in 2048. But undoing it would be very difficult legally, and thus I think it's likely to be indefinitely in place. Uh, as for the MPAs, uh, ASOC and IEN jointly launched this discussion in 2002 at Camelar. And in 2004, we endorsed the Biological Diversity Convention goal of a global network of marine reserves. Our first priority was the Ross Sea, which we saw as perhaps the most intact and representative ocean on the planet. And as you saw on the slides above earlier, after years of campaigning, Camelar finally agreed to create the largest MPA on earth there in 2016. Since then, progress has been somewhat stalled. It has to have consensus of all the member states to agree. And we're still working hard to secure large MPAs in the Weddell Sea, East Antarctica, and around the peninsula. Uh, in conclusion, working in this field for 40 years teaches me that governments can be motivated to do important things they otherwise wouldn't do. The keys to positive outcomes are having strong partnerships, focusing on science and values, and never giving up. This Packard Award will help raise Antarctica's importance for the global public, and I hope it will influence governments to complete the NPA network in the Southern Ocean 
as well as creating new protected areas on the continent. Those goals are enshrined in IUCN's and WPCA's 2021 to 24 programs, which should help induce member governments to act. Uh, experience with the environmental protocol and the Southern MPAs provide important lessons for the ongoing high seas negotiations, and uh, I hope they prove a good model. Thank you again. It's a great honor to accept this award. Thanks again, Jim, and, uh, and for those years of dedication. I now have the pleasure to invite uh, the Deputy Chair of WCPA, Dr. Julia Miranda Londoño, to present the next award. Julia. Thank you, Trevor. For me, it is a great pleasure to give the Fred Packer Award 2021 to Silvana Campello. In recognition of Silvana Campello and her husband, George, who have made a major contribution to conservation of the Cerrado Amazon ecotone in the Cantao region of Brazil since 1996. <coughs> Together, together, they established Instituto Araguaya, which is renowned among conservationists in Brazil. Prior to their efforts in this region, the poaching of rare and endangered fauna was rife. Their determination and courage over the years to protect this magnificent corner of central Brazil has resulted in the return of endangered species such as the giant otter, Arapaima jaguar, and Arawaya river dolphin. Most importantly, both Cantao and Instituto Araguaya are now supported and celebrated by local communities as well as by government authorities. This would not have been possible without the careful planning and implementation of effective conservation programs and the dedicated efforts of, of Silvana and her husband, George. Now, Silvana, before we start, she said the citation mentions George. So Silvana has invited George to join her. Welcome to George and welcome to Silvana. Would you like to say a few words before we screen your, your video? Yes, um, thank you very much. And it's been an honor uh, to be an awardee of the Fred Packard Award. Um, I have uh, asked our hosts permission to send a video instead of uh, spending my uh, minutes um, talking because uh, we are here in Canton and it's a very remote area. Therefore, we never trust our internet connection to be um, withstanding all this, uh, this timing. So um, I will um, give Rushir the opportunity to, to turn on the video and I thank you so much everybody here my friends who are participating our hosts my friends at IUCN it's really an honor thank you great thank you Silvana and Jorge I understand not George <laughs> hi my name is Silvana Campelo I am a field biologist I've always loved to be in the field 
outdoors activities have always played an important part in my life. I was lucky. My career was built upon the design, creation and management of protected areas. I firmly believe that well-managed protected areas are the only solution possible for the conservation of wildlife and the ecological processes it depends on. I was also lucky to have met George, my partner in life, who shares with me this passion for nature. Together, George and I have worked for the creation and management of more than 10 land and aquatic parks in Brazil. In 1998, we were appointed members of the WCPA by two iconic conservationists, Graham Kelleher and Larry Hamilton. Larry told me it was important to inspire people. I enjoy to be with students and volunteers in the field, trying to develop new survey methods and making full use of new technologies, but without missing the spirit of the old naturalists. In 2006, we discovered this incredible place called Cantão, an ecotone where the Cerrado biome gives way to the Amazon forest at the Araguaia River Basin in central Brazil. We knew that extensive pasture and soybean agriculture were devastating the Cerrado biome all over Brazil and that they would eventually arrive in Cantão. After conducting an ecological assessment of the area, we lobbied for the creation of Cantão Park and founded our NGO Instituto Araguaia to help protect this incredible ecosystem. I believe that nature conservation can only be achieved if local stakeholders help implement conservation actions. So, we sold everything and moved permanently to Cantão. Besides research, fire prevention and patrolling, we implement a strong community outreach program, which includes presentations, sports and cultural events, and observations of the night sky without light pollution in order to build a strong constituency for Canton Park among the locals. But only the Amazon side of this amazing Amazon Cerrado ecotone was protected within Canton Park. The uniquely fertile soils of the adjacent Cerrado are ideal for agriculture and all the land is private, with no possibility of government protected areas. To counter this, we developed a successful program to establish a corridor of private reserves in the Cerrado adjacent to Cantão Park. Private reserves, RPPNs in Portuguese, are a formal part of Brazil's national system of protected areas, equivalent to IUCN Category 2 protected areas. So far, Instituto Araguaia has purchased 700 hectares of pristine Cerrado, which are being converted into private reserves in perpetuity. By 2019, 70% of the Cerrado biome was lost to soy monoculture and pasture. By 2020, fires and deforestation have consumed 20% of the entire Amazon forest. But our conservation efforts have been successful. Canton Park and our private reserves have remained intact. Our goal is to keep them that way. On behalf of our entire team, I accept IUCN's Fred Packard Award. Recognition like this comes as a great relief in times of the COVID pandemic and also gives us the encouragement to keep on going despite the unfavorable political scenario of Brazil. Oh, thanks so much, uh, Silvana and George, uh, for your efforts and congratulations from everybody. Now we're going to move to a slightly different format for the next award because we invited uh, Maria Zupancic Vichar from Slovenia, who is a past a, a very prominent WCPA member, regional vice chair for Europe, and also a former Packard awardee herself to, uh, to record this uh, in introduction to the award. Ah, oh, there's Maria is online. Maria, you had to say hello. <laughs> Okay. Hello to everybody. I'm very glad to see you all in real. I'm very happy to be with you.
We are totally happy to have you with us too, Maria. I looked for your name, but I didn't find it. So great, excellent. Let's play the introduction. Thanks, Maria. I am Maria Zupancic-Vicar from Slovenia, and I am honored to present the Packard Award to Penelope Penifigis from Australia, Oceania. In recognition for her lifetime dedicated to Australian and global conservation. Prominent in all debates on biodiversity conservation in Australia, she is a leading figure in the Australian environmental movement and in the early 80s she worked as national lobbyist for the Australian Conservation Foundation, served as their vice president and was elevated to honorary life member and patron in 2005. She has served on numerous NGOs and statutory conservation boards and was made an officer of the Order of Australia in recognition of her many contributions to conservation. She has worked tirelessly at both national and international levels to promote protected areas in all their forums, leading to new protected areas, increased budgets, the involvement of indigenous peoples in land and sea management, the promotion of connectivity conservation and the relevance of ecosystems for climate change mitigation and adaptation. As a prophylic author, Penny has published extensively on conservation topics. During her tenure as uh, director of the Australian Committee for IUCN, it became a leading contributor to Australian conservation policy discussions. As the serving vice chair for Oceania of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, uh, the WCPA, Penny has provided inspirational and highly effective leadership and has championed the WCPA Young Professionals. Well, thanks again, uh, Maria, for that introduction and the citation and congratulations to Penny uh, for her uh, amazing contributions to WCPA and the world of protected and conserved areas. So Maria, is there anything else you'd like to say? Just to say hello to everybody, and I'm very happy to see you in this uh, in this form. <laughs> Great, and I'm sure Penny. Is... And congratulations again to Penny. Yes. So now I'd like to invite uh, Penelope Figures, Penny, to us to uh, respond. Penny, the floor is yours. Just unmute and reach your help. There right. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Trevat, and thank you, Maria. You are one of the great figures of WCPA, and it's lovely to see you. And good evening to everybody from Sydney, Australia. And I know, too, that it, um, it is the land of the traditional people of, of the Sydney, that I'm speaking to you from the uh, Sydney, and it is the traditional lands of the Aora Nation. I have indigenous things behind me, so I felt that was appropriate. Um, I'm delighted and really honoured to receive this award. I don't think there is any greater honour than having the people that you profoundly respect uh, recognize the value of your efforts over time. Uh, as is traditional in award ceremonies, I want to say some quick thank yous. First of all, it's to my parents who sadly aren't with us anymore, but they were the contributors to my life because we were taken, uh, my parents loved fishing, and we went all along the wild then, the very wild coasts of New South Wales, the beautiful beaches and forests, and that absolutely embedded in me 
uh, a profound love of the natural world, which I've never lost and has been a major motivation of my life. I also want to thank the companions of my late 20s. Uh, when I was completing my degree in political science, it sort of took me back into the wilderness of Northern Blue Mountains of New South Wales. And when they became threatened with mining and uh, logging and damming, uh, that took me into formally into the environment movement of Australia. And uh, that has been a wonderful thing that's shaped my life. And we, I'm glad to say we won that campaign and that is now the famed Wallamai National Park where the extraordinary botanical uh, fossil was found of the Wallamai pine. Uh, my combined interest in politics and policy and environment led to my leaving life as a junior academic and becoming a full, the only then full-time lobbyist in the national capitalist, the <laughs> capital, um, for the Australian Conservation Foundation. I was very lucky. It was an incredibly interesting time. It was the time of a, a massive battle to save the wilderness area of Tasmania, in particular to stop the damming of the Franklin Dam. And it brought me into contact with uh, many of the great figures of Australian conservation. And I stayed... Uh, Soon after that, I met my wonderful husband, and that's a very, very big thank you tonight. Uh, I married this wonderful man in the mid 80s, and he took, we went to the spectacular Red Heart of Australia. And that gave us a wonderful, uh, privileged experience of interacting with the ancient culture of Australia's indigenous people. Um, at this time, I returned to ACF and I became, I was elected as the first woman vice president of this national organization. And that led me into uh, many, many roles and many, many experiences, but many satisfactions too, because ACF and the environment movement were part of, for example, the World Heritage Declaration of Uluru Katajuta National Park, the full declaration of the Great Barrier Reef uh, as a marine protected area, the protection of the wet tropical rainforests, the completion of the Kakadu National Park. And I'm proud to have had a small role at least in many of those decisions. Bruce shares my profound commitment to the environment and also does a great deal. My daughters too, I think, as they have tolerated many absences over the years. I'm immensely grateful to the late Peter Hitchcock, which, who is the person I know many of you will know, uh, who suggested I join WCPA back in the 90s. And uh, I became more and more interested in protected areas. And my great thanks to Nick Lopakin because he's right there. And to you, Nick, because he appointed me vice chair in 2005. My thanks to all the subsequent chairs too, particularly my dear friend, Kathy McKinnon. Lastly, my immense thanks to all the colleagues and friends of this last 15 fantastic and stimulating years on the WCPA's as, uh, steering committee. What a wonderful organization it is. It has been an immense privilege working with such outstanding people from across the world. I've learned so much, made profound and special friendships and shared some of the best moments of my life. But most of all, it's allowed me to contribute to the most fundamental issue I believe on earth, the conservation of the miraculous and very beautiful living fabric of the earth, which sustains us all. So I thank you all so much for the truly great honor of the Fred Packard Award. Thank you. And of course we thank you too, Penny, for that amazing contribution. Thanks, Trevor. Well, we're now going to move to the Philippines where it's my great pleasure to give the Packard Award to Romeo V. Trono. And this is in recognition of Romeo Trono, for his courage and dedication in inspiring and pursuing the establishment of the first transboundary protected area 
can remain turtles in the world. Romeo's efforts over 35 years have even meant risking his life for the continued protection of these amazing species in remote islands of the Philippines. His perseverance and passion in protecting national and regional ecosystems, as well as marine wildlife throughout their life cycles are inspiring to conservationists worldwide. As project leader of the Powican Conservation Project, Romeo worked to save turtles from local extinction by fighting the collection and poaching of turtle eggs in the turtle islands of the Philippines. Under his leadership, the project led to an unprecedented increase of over 700% in green turtle eggs between 1984 and 2012. During his tenure as country director of WWF and of Conservation International Philippines, his expertise and inputs were instrumental in negotiating regional agreements. These included the comprehensive action plans of the Sulu, Sulawesi Marine Ecoregion, as well as national initiatives, such as the design of networks of marine sanctuaries in three Philippine marine biodiversity corridors. Neither political pressure, nor armed poachers, nor adverse weather conditions were able to prevent Romeo from pursuing his goals. Whichever project he tackled, he worked to ensure the long-term impacts of his work, maintaining a balance between environmental conservation and human well-being. His ability to bring together stakeholders and resolve conflicting agendas through clear communications and much good humor earned him much respect and appreciation from key actors in the field of conservation. So please join me in congratulating Romeo Vitorino on receiving the Fred M. Packard International Parks Merit Award. Thanks, Romeo. Listen, let me join with my congratulations also and invite Romeo to uh, respond. Romeo, you're there? Yes. Uh, thank you, Patty and uh, Trevor. Uh, good evening from the Philippines. Uh, first of all, I would like to express uh, my most sincere gratitude to the selection committee, to the jurors, and the WCPA Executive Committee for selecting me as one of this year's awardees for the Fred M. Packard Award for outstanding service to protected areas. In this time of a global health crisis due to the pandemic, good news very rarely come along. And I and me and my family have been facing serious uh, professional and financial challenges which are mostly brought about by the lockdowns and a long list of restrictions. This award definitely comes as a blessing and an uplifting news. It is therefore with deep humility and a grateful heart that I accept this recognition. Throughout my 30 years of full-time conservation work, I've always been involved with protected areas, both marine as well as terrestrial, in many different ways and capacities such as crafting of policies and legislations, management, capacity building, fundraising, enforcement, and protected area network establishment. Of all the protected areas I have worked and supported, the Turtle Islands has always been the foundation of my, my more than three decades of career in conservation. It was on those islands where I developed and nurtured my passion 
for protected areas and species conservation. I was 22 years old, uh, newly married, and uh, adjust my uh, my first child actually when I was deployed to the Turtle Islands. On a map, the site is more than 1,000 kilometers away from my home and family in Manila, but it used to take us two to three weeks of difficult travel. We used to live on the island for three to four months in a small dilapidated makeshift uh, dwelling. No toilet, no electricity, no communication, no regular mode of transportation. And we were living off a $3 per diem. We, we experienced months of delays in our salaries, which forced us to borrow money so just so our families in Manila can have something to live on while we were posted in the Turtle Islands and working under constant threat from local poachers. When we started working in the Turtle Islands in 1982, the decline of uh, nesting incidents was already at an 88% level based on historical data from the 1950s. Our goal was quite simple and straightforward, and that is to stop and eventually reverse the decline in nesting incidents and release into the wild as many hatchlings as we can. With all the difficulties we were facing, I realized early on that it was going to be easier said than done. The protected status of Baguan Island as a marine turtle sanctuary gave my team the legal mandate to seriously enforce regulations to protect as many nests as we can and protect we did along the island's 1.2 kilometers nesting beach. We recorded as many as 40 nests per night. For city dwellers like me and my team, those nightly encounters with sea turtles was quite a sight and an amazing experience. We were operating on a natural laboratory where the opportunity to learn, to conduct research and experience firsthand protected area management and conservation threatened sea turtles for all of us was just extraordinary. Less than 30 years later, the annual nesting data in the Turtle Islands started to show an unprecedented increase of 700%. From a single 34-hectare island sanctuary, Baguan Island evolved and expanded into the Turtle Islands Wildlife Sanctuary, encompassing all of the six Philippine islands and surrounding waters with a size of 242,958 hectares. And later, through an agreement between the governments of Malaysia and the Philippines, the Turtle Islands Heritage Protected Area became the first transboundary protected area for green turtles. I'm truly thankful for the opportunities of being able to lead, to support, and participate in such exciting and challenging conservation processes. I now work as an independent consultant, currently helping with the development and planning of two GEF-funded projects, which features, among others, the establishment of new protected areas and marine key biodiversity areas, expansion and strengthening of existing protected areas, and establishing networks of marine protected areas. My passion for protected areas and biodiversity conservation remain, and I am looking forward to many more years of providing advice and support for protected areas. Over the past 40 years, I have come to realize that working on protected areas is intergenerational in nature. There is a need to develop to capacitate and nurture the next generations of experts, advocates, and champions for protected areas. With this recognition, it is my hope that I may still be able to engage in more protected area work and share my knowledge and experience. In this time of global health crisis, protected areas become even more relevant and should be given increased attention as a potent tool to reduce the incidence of zoonotic diseases that are spread between animals and people by maintaining healthy habitats and ecosystems for wildlife and biodiversity. I would like to especially thank colleagues, friends, partners, and communities who I have worked with and supported me in my conservation endeavors. Most of all, 
I thank God for his constant presence, his guidance, his wisdom and protection. Again, my heartfelt gratitude to WCPA and also my congratulations to all of this year's awardees. Thank you very much and have a good day, good evening to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Romeo, for your lifelong long contributions to protected and conserved areas. I think you are speaking directly to the hearts of most people on this uh, event. Um, Thank so, you. so now again, let me return to Julia to introduce the next awardee. Julia. Thank you, Trevor. It is my great pleasure to give the Fred Packer Award 2021 to a person I admire so much, Dr. Dan LaFolle. In recognition of Professor Dan LaFolle as an outstanding and inspiring figure in global marine conservation and a major contribut contributor over many years to the work of IUCN and WCPA on marine conservation. Dan has applied himself tirelessly to communicating the wonder and vulnerability of the world's ocean environment and the profound need for large-scale expansion of well-protected and well-managed marine protected areas. has made a major contribution to the growth of global awareness of the importance of the ocean. Through presentations, publications, innovative online resources, and through bro brokering high level relationships and partnerships. Dan is a well known uh, and well respected marine biologist, science communicator, and ocean protection champion. His expertise and strategic advance, advice are frequently requested by ministers of, of governments. And heads of leading environmental organizations and academia. His work and compelling energy have led to countless improvements for marine protected areas around the world. All right, so thank you so much, Julia, and congratulations to Dan for the, his amazing contributions and, and for this award. Dan, um, you're invited to take the floor. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Trevor and Julia. I think actually some of those pictures document my loss of hair more than anything <laughs> else over the many years. But um, uh, what can I say? Well, thank you all very much for giving me this award. Um, I, as, as Penny also mentioned, I think it, it means a great deal coming from yourselves as the global protected area community. But just as our ocean is massive, so the job is massive in trying to improve protection. Um, and that's been a massive team effort. So, so in accepting this award, I also pay tribute and thanks to all of my colleagues, especially in the World Commission on Protected Areas, um, all, all the marine leads in particular, the marine young professionals and other close friends and colleagues across the entire IU, IUCN family and beyond. In many countries, work throughout the world on this uh, with colleagues in the Global Marine and Polar Programme, the Species Survival Commission, and many, many more, more where we all work together on, a, on a, a daily basis with a tireless effort to convince governments that, you know, our life-giving ocean needs far greater protection than we're giving it at the moment. So in accepting this award, it sort of also kind of, make, kind of makes me think of how did I end up being here? Um, and I guess I've always had a strong connection to nature, being born on a small island, uh, Jersey and the Channel Islands, and 
I think seeing and experiencing nature as a kid, as, as we all know, is, is it's, well, it's not just good for the soul, it becomes part of your soul. And my parents were always encouraging and supporting me throughout. And it's a, a gratitude to them that's been there, but has somehow continued to grow with each advancing year. And I think it's that kind of combination of being by the ocean throughout my childhood that has made the ocean such a large part of my life. Um, and my career as a result has given me opportunities to know and work with so many amazing people. And I've even got to meet and know some of my my childhood heroes, David Attenborough, Cousteau's, Sylvia Earle, and many more, who I, and some of whom I now sort of count as uh, good friends. And I guess what inspires and drives me, and I, I guess no doubt many of you as well, is that, that original kind of kid-like sense of wonder and discovery. I think if you, if you enjoy your job and you wake up each day and, and you learn new things, it's kind of, it's like an engine that drives you forward and, and it helps you tackle the, the increasingly serious problems and issues we see around us. And, and certainly for me, it's, it's where I sort of drive inspiration to keep me positive on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and through that, I, I sort of, as I say, really count myself so lucky to be doing the job I love. And as I slightly worryingly move towards my sixth decade, I'm getting old now, um, I'm honored to count myself as one of the recipients of this award. And right now, the, the world needs strong voices for nature. And as the Director General mentioned at the start, the mood is changing as, as frankly, I think all of us, no matter how engaged we've been over the years, we're, we're, we're sort of left reeling in alarm at, at just what uh, an unhealthy state of the planet and an unhealthy relationship with nature can bring to all of us and can have to us as a species as, as, as a consequence of how COVID has touched all our lives. And I think that that mood's changing to one of reflection and a desire not to go back to how it was before and to grow back greener. And despite all, all that darkness that, is, that the pandemic's brought to so many people, I think it's also given people a lot of time to reflect. At one point, two thirds of the world's population was under stay at home orders, which is just staggering. And I think it's, it's helped all of us to reflect on what matters most, friends, family, the quality of life, but also how important nature is, green spaces and those wild places and how essential they are to our, our well-being. And I think we must, we must establish a new rhythm in all our daily lives to be more in tune, more in sync with nature and the needs of the planet. And I think we now know what really matters and, and the coming years are probably going to be more important than the last 10,000 years in, in putting things back in order. And you, you won't be surprised when I say I think the ocean lies at the heart of that, the blue heart of that process. Because with no healthy ocean, there is no healthy planet. As Sylvia Earle reminds us, no ocean, no us. So, um, so this being given this award really inspires me to keep doing what I do to the best way I can do it to make it happen with the people in the community I, I love. And um, I'm just extremely grateful, proud and honoured to receive the Packard Award. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you so much, Dan. Congratulations. Our blue-green planet. Our green-blue planet. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and so now it is my great pleasure to invite uh, Peter Cochran, who is also an IUCN counselor and a great friend and supporter of WCPA to present the next award. Peter stayed up very late in Australia for this as well as others on the call. Peter. Thank you, Trevor. I'm delighted to present the next uh, Packard Award to Dave McKinnon. And his citation uh, is coming up on your screen now. It reads, in, in recognition of David McKinnon and his lifelong commitment to nature conservation and protected areas in Nova Scotia, Canada and beyond. Through his role with Nova Scotia's protected areas program, he continues to work diligently and unwaveringly toward the protection of ecologically important areas. Dave has created a lasting legacy beyond his work with government 
having co-led the formation of the Nova Scotia Nature Trust more than 25 years ago. His contributions to the work of the trust have resulted in protection for thousands of acres of private land. Among his many achievements with the Nova Scotia government, Dave helped establish the Crown Share Land Legacy Trust, the Our Parks and Protected Areas Plan, and played a major role in selecting and securing extensive new public lands for conservation in Nova Scotia. For nearly 15 years, Dave has contributed to the work of the Canadian Council on Ecological Areas and most recently in the definition and recognition of other effective area-based conservation measures in Canada and beyond. He continues to play a leading role in the Pathway to Canada Target One initiative. Congratulations, Dave. Thanks very, thank you very much, Peter, and congratulations to Dave on, on the award. Dave, would you like to respond? Uh, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. First of all, I want to say thanks to the IUCN WCPA for, uh, for giving me this award. It's, it's a great honor. Um, I mentioned on the rehearsal yesterday that having been selected, I'm, I'm no longer going to demand a recount. Um, also, uh, you know, I generally avoid the spotlight. So my daughter, Maggie, helpfully suggested that if I can't think of anything to say, I could just say and do nothing uh, and pretend my screen froze for the next five minutes. <laughs> but, um, but first, actually, I want to thank my family my parents, Roy, and my late mother, Marilyn, my sisters, Kathy and Donna, and my wonderful stepmother, uh, Barb. My folks, you know, they got me outside, as others have mentioned, connecting to nature away from the, the, two, the two TV channels we had. Um, but they also let me skip supper to watch Untamed World on Sunday nights. Um, I want to thank Aunt Margaret McKinnon for carrying so much of the burden of family raising and her own career and for always supporting my work uh, in many underappreciated ways. To my, my children, Maggie and Niall, for... Uh, sometimes enthusiastically participating in my birthday and Father's Day adventures, uh, which on those days I was entitled to dictate, and which uh, I intended to indoctrinate them into nature. Um, and now they're taking on their own adventures, some of which are, uh, you know, uh, ex in exhibit that love of nature. So, uh, um, you know, I'm very proud. Um, to my partner, Sally Steele, and to Maya and Nico, with whom I have shared many great adventures, uh, I want to give my gratitude, and particularly to Sally, who, you know, against my advice against time wasting, saw a connection between the Fred Packard Award and my work, and took it upon herself to complete the nomination. Regarding the work that uh, is being recognized, it's all been the work of groups. Um, so in Nova Scotia, I'm particularly grateful to have worked with so many great people who deserve this award equally or more. And I want to mention particularly uh, my former directors, Dale Smith and John LeDuc, uh, longtime colleagues and collaborators, Karen Baisley, Kermit DeGoyer, Bonnie Sutherland, and Ray Plord. And also give a special thanks to my current director, Peter Labor, for his help in strategizing and support for his people skills, uh, for giving me a long leash, and, and for not asking too many questions. And also um, to my early influencers who are no, no longer uh, with us, Bill Friedman, Ian McLaren, and Colin Stewart. I also want to thank my colleagues in the Canadian Council of Ecological Areas. There, um, you know, there's no more dedicated, effective collection of people who dedicate their lives to the conservation of nature except I would say uh, the awardees here and, uh, and the members of the, w, you know, the WCPA steering committee and executive committee. Um, but uh, in CCA, I want to particularly recognize uh, my longtime uh, partner in crime, Jacques Perron, as well as Robert Ailey, 
uh, Chris Lemieux, Heather Lazaruk, John Langwa, Jessica Elliott, Claudia Haas, Tom Beachy, Jason Kelly, Libby McCaldin, and Maurice Bourgeois, and particularly for their work uh, in Canada on defining OECMs before that work had really begun anywhere else, and which ultimately had a big influence on the global interpretation. And amongst other Canadian collaborators, I particularly want to thank Alison Woodley from Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, Stephen Woodley from uh, IUCN WCPA, uh, Sabina Jessen, uh, formerly of CPAWS, and Richard Pither uh, and Zuzu Gadala from Parks from Environment Canada. And lastly, I want to thank the members of the task force on OECMs, uh, other effective area-based conservation measures, many of whom are also WCP executive committee or steering committee members, and particularly Kathy McKinnon, Trevor Sandwith, Harry Jonas, Stephen Woodley, and Dan LaFoley. The coining you know, of the term other effective area-based conservation measures in 2010 created new opportunities to recognize effective on the ground conservation, but it also created a risk that new targets for protection would be met by county and areas that were not particularly effective and the WCPA um, steering committee and executive executive committee stepped up and created a global task force to ensure that OECMs fulfilled their promise. And and to you folks, you know, I've seen uh, I really caught only glimpses of your work, but I'm amazed at your graceful determination and your savoir faire to conserve nature. And I just want to say that you're doing heroic and noble work. Um, as Dan mentioned, conservation is a worldwide effort and it's undertaken at many scales, but without you in the lead, biodiversity would be being lost much faster than it is now. Um, and, and your work has had meaning and impact for me and many others that you'll probably never appreciate. So again, I want to thank, uh, thank you for this award and congratulate all the other uh, awardees and uh, yeah, thanks very much. And thank you, Dave. You, you mentioned a number of things, including longevity, lots of people and leadership. And I think leadership is the one that most of our awardees today are, are really characterized for. It's now my pleasure to invite Julia Miranda to announce our next award. Three more awards. Julia. Thank you, Trevor. It is my great pleasure to uh, announce the Fred Packer Award 2021 to Denise Rambaldi. In recognition of Denise Rambaldi for her work to establish the Sao Joao River Watershed Environmental Protection Area in Rio de Janeiro State, now designated as a federal protected area of one 150,000 hectares among a rich list of other achievements. Denise is credited with expanding the protection and connectedness of forest fragments critical to the survival of the golden lion tamarind in the Atlantic coastal forest in Brazil. as well as for her leadership in convincing the Brazilian government to establish the Biological Union Reserve and, the play, and to place the golden lion tamarind on the Brazilian 20 real banknote. Beautiful banknote. <laughs> Her conservation work over 20 years has led to the species recovery and change of status from critical in danger to endangered on the IUCN red list. Denise has been successful in gaining support of local communities and stakeholders.
including landowners and landless farmers in the common cause of habitat and species conservation. She has involved farmers in forest restoration and the establishment of corridors while enabling them to earn stable incomes. Most recently, as vice president of the Rio de Janeiro State Environmental Agency, she continues to influence, influence public policy on protected areas climate change and health. Congratulations, Denise. Thank you so much, Julia, for that introduction. And congratulations to Denise on this award. Denise, we have the pleasure to invite you to respond. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Julia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank for the honorable tribute that has been given to me by the World Commission on Protected Areas of IUCN with Fred Packard Award. This important professional recognition reminds me the time in the 80s when saving endangered species was a youthful academic dream by learning from exceptional and inspiring masters. Inspiration that I took to my professional life always dedicated to the rescue and protection of the rich Brazilian biodiversity. There were many challenges that among so many learnings taught me to be persistent and resilient. The first attempt to join the Golden Lion Tamarind Conservation Project at the Poço das Antas Biological Reserve in Rio de Janeiro countryside was unforgettable. After walking for hours on a desert road with a backpack on my back, I was received by the senior research, researcher who promptly informed that they didn't need technicians at that moment, that there was no place for me to stay in the field station and no car to take me back. Oh my God, frustrated and tired, I turned back to the road alone. And a couple of days later, the tamarins called me back, and there a professional career in biodiversity conservation had started. And this is what challenged and inspired me day by day. Since then, beyond the endangered and endemic species such as the golden lion tamarins and the river lead fishes, I have been involved on in the creation and management of protected areas to ensure enough and viable habitat for these and for many other species. Maintaining biodiversity is perhaps one of the biggest challenges nowadays. The SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has shown us how important it is to maintain the balance in the eco of the ecosystem to strengthen and consolidate the worldwide network of protected areas. Optimistically, I hope that this global event will demonstrate to the general public and to the, to the government's officials in particular, that a representative and robust network of protected areas are instrumental to understand the problem, enabling us to contribute to its solution and to the creation of new paths to the human prosperity. I am also confident that the feeling that motivates me to continue working for a more balanced, fair and sustainable planet could also inspire the next generations. This journey that, brought, that has brought me here today, driven by the fascination about our mega diversity is above all a journey of constant learning. And so far, I think that what we know about the natural and wild world around us can be described as the chronicle of the human imperfection. It is an honor to be distinguished by the IUCN as well a great responsibility and a stimulus. Initiatives like this one shed light on the global importance of protected areas. 
I would like to thank the professional of the Golden Lion Camera Association and the Casimiro de Abreu City Hall, from whom I learned a lot about conservation science, institutional management, public policies, and above all, human relations. Thanks to the State Institute of the Environmental Team in the person of its president, Phil Campello, INEA has become my home in the last decade and continues to provide me with opportunities to work and live in this spectacle of nature called Atlantic Forest. Special thanks to the Boticario Group Foundation team in the person of Malu Nunes. I was honored since the nomination for this important award. award. Eternal gratitude also to my parents who are still isolated in the Sao Paulo city and to my boyfriend who has supported me all over the years. And finally, I would like to thank all the people who contributed so that I could act and made good decisions for my personal and professional growth and success. I am the result of the confidence and the strength of each one of you. I really thank you. And thank you, Denise, uh, for your contribution and congratulations on the award. I'd like now to call on uh, former chair of WCPA, uh, Nick Lupukin, to make an award to a special colleague. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Trevor. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce the next recipient, Pedro Rosabal, for the Fred Packard Award 2021. This is in recognition of Pedro Rosabal for an extraordinary career working for protected areas as critical solutions for both effective nature conservation and supporting human needs. Pedro is a protected areas person to the core. Throughout his career, he has worked diligently and passionately for conservation and protected areas. Pedro has a deep field experience in his native Cuba and the Caribbean, which he brought to IUCN's Global Protected Areas Program, as well as the World Commission on Protected Areas. He has championed efforts to make protected areas a core focus within IUCN for over 20 years. Pedro understood the challenges faced by protected area managers and always worked to ensure that their needs were met. He was well known as the person in the IUCN secretariat to whom protected area managers and rangers could relate to as one of their own. He brought this richness of experience to bear in the design of the Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program, BIOPAMA, now effective in 79 African, Caribbean and Pacific states. Congratulations, Pedro, you well deserve it. Thank you, Nick, and, and to that I would also add, since Pedro is a, a great uh, former colleague of mine and our whole team, we really miss uh, Pedro's contribution um, and uh, have valued not only the services that he gave to IUCN, but also to WCPA, which is where I first met him. And now I'd like to ask uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Shady, who actually knew Pedro very well over many years and who worked because of his work in the World Heritage Program to make a few remarks. Peter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. And uh, thanks, everyone. So lovely to see so many faces uh, on, on this uh, Zoom call. Um, everybody has a Pedro story and each of us could speak for 30 minutes, I'm sure. I have, uh, I have three minutes to say a few words about my friend and colleague, uh, Pedro Rosabal. Pedro had a long and highly respected history of work on world heritage. Uh, he was a member of the IUCN World Heritage Panel for over 20 years. The panel drives IUCN's work as advisory body to the World Heritage Convention, crafting recommendations which influence the shape of conservation in the world's most precious places. Uh, he was at the cutting edge of analysis and action, which led to real on-ground conservation wins. Uh, he was also a highly experienced uh, mission expert, 
both evaluating new nominations to the World Heritage List and undertaking reactive monitoring missions. He provided senior level support to IUCN's work on state of conservation and was a World Heritage Elder when it came to the strategic health of the convention. When I arrived in IUCN in 1999, Pedro was already a seasoned panel member and became a mentor to me and many others, uh, Tim Badman included, who's uh, the current director of the World Heritage Program. And I know I owe Pedro about 800 cups of coffee, coffee from all of those uh, friendly chats that we would have. Pedro's uh, harrowing story of his exit from Cuba and arrival in IUCN speaks volumes to his character, his resolve, drive and passion. Uh, his qualities, passionate, fearless, fiery, a guardian of the high standards and credibility of the World Heritage Convention, exceptional conservation insight, technically impeccable with a real world filter on what works when it comes to conservation on the ground. Passionate, fearless and fiery. Did I mention these already? Some of Pedro's most colourful outbursts in the World Heritage Panel cannot be repeated here, but they all spoke to his uh, commitment. Above all, uh, Pedro is a wonderful human being, a friend and a colleague. The World Heritage Convention celebrates its 50th anniversary next year. Pedro Rosabal can take pride in the enormous personal contribution he has made in shaping the success of one of the most influential international instruments for nature conservation. His unwavering integrity is held in the highest regard in World Heritage circles, and he's a wonderful and worthy recipient of the prestigious Fred Packard Award. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peter. You remind us of many things, especially the fiery <laughs> outburst. <laughs> um, good. Um, and now it's my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Kathy McKinnon to present our final award for in today's program. Kathy. Thank you. First, I'd just like to say on behalf of WCPA, how sorry we are that Pedro couldn't join us today, but how grateful we are to him for all his guidance. And it now gives me very great pleasure to give a Fred Packard Award to my good friend and colleague, Sarat Babu Gida. Sarat is an amazing champion for conservation. And he's kept us all very honest and committed to achieving the IHG Target 11. The citation reads, in recognition of Sarat Abu Gida as a passionate advocate and champion of protected and conserved areas throughout his career. While at the Ministry of Environment and Forests in India, and since 2003, in his role as head of the Biodiversity, Science, Policy and Governance Unit at the Secretariat, of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Sarat has worked tirelessly with parties to the Convention, as well as conservation NGOs, IUCN, and especially WCPA, as well as indigenous peoples and local communities to promote effective and well-managed protected areas globally. He has championed implementation of the program of work on protected areas, which was first read in 2004. Since 2010, he's worked tirelessly to support implementation of IHG Target 11, one of the most successful of the IHG targets and now likely to be achieved at least in relation to coverage. To this end, he engaged the entire global protected areas community, organized regional workshops, liaised with national focal points, and I must say, must have sent millions of email reminders. He's also developed guidance and supported capacity building, always encouraging greater efforts to meet both coverage and quality targets of Target 11. Throughout, he's worked with passion, commitment, and unrelenting outreach to the entire global conservation and protected areas community.
Sarat, we salute you. Thank you so much, Kathy, and congratulations to Sarat. Now, Sarat was particularly interested that we featured the partnerships, uh, the Friends of the Program of Work on Protected Areas, the Friends, uh, the partnership leading to the uh, development and the achievement of Target 11. And so I'd like to call on Sarat now to amplify that message and keep us all honest, as Kathy said. Sarat, just unmute and you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Trevor, my friend. The journey which we started together in 2011, I, no, no, 2009 in Cape Town. And imagine the, the pleasures and the pains we shared. And thank you, Madam Chair, for bestowing me on this opportunity and also the great honor. Uh, I really want to really accept this, this award on behalf of the protected and the conjured areas. The national focal point, the, the CBD national focal points of the Convention on Biological Diversity, especially protected areas, the friends of the program of work on protected areas and the members of the global partnership on IC Target 11, including the steering committee. Incidentally, Madam Chair is also the chair of the, the global steering committee of the partnership on Target 11 and, and many unsung heroes who toil hard to submit their protected area updates to the WDPA within the finish line of 2020. This actually strengthened the hope for more ambitious future conservation targets in post-2020, resurrect faith for implementation of 2030 development agenda and for up upholding the UNGA resolution, that is United Nations General Assembly Resolution 65 by 161 that promulgated 211 to 2020 at the UN, UN Decade for Biodiversity to promote achieving the IT targets and the implementation of the strategic plan. So submitting this information within the deadline despite COVID-19 is remarkable. It really shows the dedication of the, of the countries and their commitment. So it is really one thing to commit and make promises, but quite different to implement and deliver. But when we commit and promise, we, have, we must implement and deliver. By submitting information by the finish line of IC target and the, the CBD parties proved that they simply do not talk or make promises, but walk the talk and deliver the promises. This is very, very important. I'm really thankful to my organization, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Secretariat, our Executive Secretary, Madam Elizabeth, and my very small team for bearing my madness and, and for allowing me to continue making the lives of the parties and the partners miserable. And as already Madam Chair told me, hundreds and millions of email reminders. So like Archbishop IG Target 11, I, I used to deliver sermons every fortnightly and make really make the life's miserable commitment means when I really pointed out, sir, you, you have committed this thing. When some countries ask me where I have committed, sir, this is the NBSAP, where it is, sir, page number 30, line number four, paragraph six, please check. Then they said, why are you taking so seriously? Sir, if you don't take seriously, who will deliver it, sir? So that is the problem. So. It is not the prerogative of one organization, one government, or one individual, one agency. It is, the, it is our collective responsibility to achieve the targets. Collectively, we, have, we all should come together, pool our energy and, and, and the resources, and push the cart or paddle the cano towards reaching the globally agreed goals and the targets. A, a target is a rallying point. It actually triggers action. When actions are underway, they catalyze further actions. Thus, inch by inch, globally agreed targets and goals can be reached and achieved. Because I'm not really simply pushing for the 17%, 10% quantitative aspects. Because this 17% or 10% are not in vacuum. When we really reach this 17% and 10%, invariably, they have implications on the qualitative aspects. They, they, they cover areas important for biodiversity, they cover ecological representation, or they cover areas important for ecosystem services like this. So it is very important to clearly point out, identify what is the gap, what is the issue, 
and what are the opportunities to address the gaps and the and the issues then collectively all of us has to come together and with our focused interventions we have to make things happen on the ground because when i really say that the next feature is the 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 green list when i really go to the countries i said you are not really putting the, the green list but you are actually addressing four qualitative elements of ig target 11 then people realize the value of it so it is really very very important that we have to come together identify the issue and identify the the opportunity and how to translate this opportunity because when we really started working on the other effective area based conservation measures many people say oh what do you mean by other effective area based conservation measures and 30% now the post 2020 is 30% so i said that if we don't reach 17% and 10% how is how we can reach 30% so first of all identify what we have and how much we can really reach that's that's very important and so getting a practical decision is just a beginning a decision will will not be happen on its own if we want the implementation to be happen we have to make it happen together that is the most important message unfortunately the the slide is not there but the the partnership slide if you can really the reason why we launched the partnership in 2018 is all the partners come together pool their energy and resources and push the cart towards reaching the goals next slide please not the, the uh, yeah this this one important you can see and all all are the partners because what i really told them is can you simply align your ongoing work in the countries towards reaching the targets and the goals then it will be helpful we will both win win situation because you know out of the 17 ig targets due for 2020 and 21 sdg targets due for 2020 the only targets related to protected and conserved areas are within reach we really don't know what we don't have about the other targets so it shows despite covid 19 how the countries have commitment commitments they translated and how the partnership has really helped to translate the commitments into ground reality that is the main message because the most important thing here is i really want to dedicate this award to my mother whom i really i lost in last october because of the covid 19 i could not really even pay my last visit last even look at my mother i couldn't even perform my last rites i just want to dedicate this award and also reaching the 17% terrestrial component my mother and also finally what i want to i want to bring out the martin luther king juniors he when he accepted the nobel peace prize he mentioned this this quotation if you can't fly then run if you can't run then walk if you can't walk then crawl but whatever you do you have to keep moving forward now we had it this advice is really timeless and a reminder that we we is a stock remind the covid 19 really gave us reminded us we can do only the good work and improve the world by moving forward then our partnership added the only way to move forward is to move forward together then only achieve the goals and the targets would be a reality then it will really resurrect the faith and confidence so the protected and conserved areas family has really done it and this is the best example a practical example for sdg 17 it's not simply talking it walks the talk and so i, I, I want you I, i want to thank uh, sarat uh, no, no, he's no, demonstrating no, no. his indefatigable energy that tenacious persistence no, that all of our leaders no, have no no and, just um, one minute, last last minute because i have to thank my wife otherwise i will not <laughs> yeah i'm failing <laughs> so please please bear with me at the end because you know if if i don't really acknowledge my wife for her forbearance and even when i was in deathbed she reminded me the the, the remaining 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers to reach the 17% in last october and which country is still pending i was really thankful to her and my to my daughter 
Saroj and my two grandkids, very, very infant grandkids for their own future. We have to conserve this world. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Saraj, and congratulations. And I think Saraj speaks for all of the winners and all of the, the partners and collaborators that this is a, a, a joint effort that's only possible because of leadership, because of those partnerships, and because of, of that, your inspiring example. And with that, I'm going to just return uh, briefly to Kathy McKinnon for a, final, a few final words, Kathy. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Sarat. I wish we could bottle your energy. <laughs> I want to thank all of the awardees because your stories are truly inspiring. We have given out by today 130 awards in 40 years. That's only three a year. So that means you are part of a very, very select group of people. There are lots more inspiring champions out there working in protected and conserved areas, but we had to make a choice and we came up with nine outstanding individuals. We all congratulate you. I want to take this opportunity also to recognize some of the previous Packard awardees, many of whom were friends and mentors to me. People like Fatih Singh and H.S. Kanwa in India, who showed me tigers for the first time. Larry Hamilton, who Silvana mentioned, and who was always very good at ringing up when I was at the World Bank and saying, hey, Lass, we just need a few dollars to do something. Can you, and who could resist that charm? People like Graham Kelleher, uh, Robbie Robinson, Alinda Perez Alindo, Afendi Samaja, and Paxija Bawo from Indonesia, with whom I worked for a long time. And that's when I first got engaged with WCPA. Hal Eisvik, the three uh, Packard awardees, Nick, Peter, and Maria, who made citations today as well as, of course, as our own deputy chair, Julia, who is also a Packard awardee. So you are in a very select company. Sadly, some of our previous awardees are no longer with us. And I particularly want to recognize two of them who died at the end of last year. Graham Warboys, who many of you knew because of his passionate work on mountains and connectivity, and Widodo Ramono, who took me to see uh, Javan rhinos in Ujong Kulong Reserve in Indonesia. Both of them were great conservation. I also want to recognize the awardees who are still working tirelessly for WCPA. People like Claudio Moretti, who is our regional vice chair for South America and did so much good work on organizing CAPLAC 3 in Peru in 2019. And Adrian Phillips, who I hope is still on the call. He's a former WCPA chair, but he kindly came out of his alleged retirement to produce as editor, the special issue of Parks that we released on COVID-19 last week. It's always a great privilege to work with everybody in WCPA. And I'm absolutely delighted to have you all enter the WCPA Hall of Fame. I want to thank Ruchia and Trevor and the team at the Protected Areas Program for organizing this event. I know it's hard to really get together on Zoom, but I think we've had an inspiring event. And the next time we all get together in person, we'll certainly be raising a few glasses to celebrate. So thank you all very much and well done. Thanks very much, Kathy. And with that, uh, we come to the end of our, our event today. And as Kathy, Kathy said, uh, we hope that we're going to see you in person in the very near future. Hang in there and keep on doing this amazing work. It's what keeps us all going, even though we're isolated in our respective corners of the planet we know at least the planet's in safe hands. Thank you all again and, and 
Good evening, good morning, good night, sleep well. Thanks so much, everyone, for making this event such a success, and congratulations to all the winners.